All right, so we start our fourth topic today, uh, which is investment and valuation. Uh, but before I start uh, this topic as such, I would like to discuss with you that um, we shall not have any class next week uh, formally. I would be around, uh, but I really want that the next week session the, or the next week lecture duration you should use for your practice for the presentations uh, and the exam. And you come to school only if you need my help or if you have something, something else to do, right? But don't come for this lecture, okay? Uh, so if you have any problems, issues, I would be at my desk, which is my room is 211, B211, the same flow. Uh, if you have any questions, you want to see me, just show up or write me an email and I can come and receive you um, in the, at, at, the, at the entrance. Uh, so uh, the next week uh, would be, because today is 30th, so the next week would be, 7th of May, right? So on 7th of May, you will not come for the lecture. You only come for the, if you have any problems, right? And then on 14th of May, two weeks from now, you will be doing your presentations, the group presentations. I hope you are aware, right? And then on 21st of May, you will be doing the exam, right? So on 21st of May, your course will be over. I repeat, no formal lecture next week. You only come if you have any questions to ask me. Otherwise, uh, you are not meant to, you're not supposed to be here. And then comes uh, the 14th of May when you present group presentations and 21st of May is your exam day and that's it. So your syllabus for the exam is the last slide which I cover today. I may cover the whole topic today. It could be possible that I'm not able to cover some of the slides. So the slide where I stop would be the last slide, right? Obviously, this topic will not be used for your presentation because there's no task based on it. So, but natural, this topic is only relevant for your examination. But as I said, either I cover the full topic today, then it's simple. If I don't cover the full topic, then the last slide, which I study, which I discuss with you, that is the last slide for the syllabus. That's it. I hope it makes sense. Um, I'm recording it, so this video will be on the YouTube for you. Um, said the topic is investment and valuation. Uh, a disclaimer, I have deliberately mellowed down this topic substantially, which means that I'm not going to discuss very advanced um, uh, contents of this topic. So this I deliberately on purpose, I kept this topic very uh, fundamental, very rudimentary so that you can understand the very, it's a very beginning level. Uh, valuation topic. However, uh, if you want to have some more advanced uh, knowledge of valuation, then I strongly uh, recommend you to, to see the thesis.fee. And you will see some of the topics, some of my students who have done really, you know, deep down valuation, very real, in-depth valuation. I mean, those, some of those theses which are at the bachelor level, they can easily be the master's level thesis, you know? And the one example which I would like to give you uh, of a thesis, uh, if you are interested in the valuation, uh, let me show you the link. Uh, I can check uh, the thesis, which you can see. So if I have to recommend you one, um, if you, I mean, first of all, if you're interested, 
uh, in knowing more about valuation really deep down, then I would strongly recommend you that on this thesis.fee, uh, my former student, Lee Hugh, he wrote this fantastic thesis. Uh, Lee Hugh is now studying in USA, he's doing his PhD uh, in finance. So he wrote this thesis a few years ago, and this is a fabulous piece of work. It's a full PDF is available if you're interested to know. Uh, if you want to really go deep into valuation, that how the companies are valued. And now I have two more students, uh, Duck and Kim, they both are from Vietnam. And they are in a few, in the next few days, they would be submitting the thesis. And basically, uh, Duck is researching about the housing market valuation in the USA. And, and something similar work, uh, Nguyen Kim uh, is doing. Um, about the valuation. So my, my point is that in the next few days, you will see more valuation thesis uh, in this website. But otherwise, if you really want to see the more conceptual and empirical uh, details about valuation, then, uh, then Le Hu's thesis, he's also from Vietnam and now he's doing his PhD in, 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 in I think he's in uh, University of New Mexico. So he's doing, he's studying there. All right, so let's get back to the work. Uh, this topic is pretty much right. Uh, the first criteria very about the valuation is the net present value. Um, a firm, if you want to define what is a firm, a firm is a series of cash flow generated in the future. So basically, you are evaluating a firm by the sum total of its present value of the future cash flows. The company would generate cash flows for the series of periods, but you want to find the present value. The same criteria you can use it for if you want to check the uh, success or the feasibility of an investment project. The decision to invest or not to invest depends on if your discounted estimated cash flows in the future, if some of them is larger then the initial cost of capital, the capital investment, not cost of capital, but the capital expenditure. Uh, let's say you want to start a project which will cost you $2 million. And this project would last seven years. So if today, today means time zero. Today means time zero. One time one, it could be one month, one year, all right, and so on and so forth. If today a project or a machine is costing you, uh, let's say one million uh, US dollar and, the, and this machine would last for seven years with you, which means that for seven years, this machine is going to give you some cash inflows. So you estimate them, right? But you discount it because the dollar you receive tomorrow is not as valuable as today. The dollar of cash inflow, which you get after one year, two years, three years, is not as valuable as today. Hmm? A, bird is, a bird in hand is worth two in bushes. Something you will get, you may not get. It's risky. But you have, what you have now is not risky. It's a reality, isn't it? So therefore, those expected cash flows in the future are having some riskiness. So this riskiness is, this risk is recognized with the help of the rate of discount. And as this topic proceeds, you will know how and where this discount rate come from. Mm -hmm. And then we discount these cash flows, we add them up, all right, now I'll give you a simple example. Let's say, now you have to do this oral maths by yourself, okay. Uh, a project costs you $1 million today. The life of the machine is five years. 
Mm -hmm. Now, the cash inflows which you get for the future are, let's say, uh, 22,000 a year, every year. So I repeat, uh, a machine may cost you, a project may cost you 1 million um, US dollars today. Uh, this, this machine would last for five years and the cash inflow that this machine is generating is uh, 220,000 a year. So 220,000 a year. Now, do you think that this project is acceptable or not acceptable? If you do this oral calculation, is it acceptable or not? Okay, so, uh, as I said before, the present, uh, the cost of uh, investment, or if you want to spend some money on this machine or a project, the expenditure now, now means time zero, and C means cost. So C zero means cost now. If you have to invest in this project, it will cost you 1 million US dollars. And the life of the machine is five years. And then I said that every year you get the cash inflows 220,000. So it means if I add all the future cash streams, C1 means the cash flow coming in after one year. Yeah. So C1, C2, C3. C4 plus C5, which means 220,000. Uh, is it so? Yeah. Multiply by five. You know why I'm multiplying by five? Because this cash inflow will come for five years. So altogether, you have 100, uh, sorry, 1.1 1 .1 million us dollars so this i can say sum of cash inflows from i one year to five years and c i so if i want to make a algorithm of c1 plus c2 plus c3 plus c4 plus c5 i can say c i means a future cash inflow from year one to year five. And sigma means sum. Does it make sense? The question is that I'm investing, if I invest, it will be 1 million US dollars. And the expected cash inflow is 1.1 million USD. Do you think that this project should be accepted or the, if you compare with the formula do you find that there is some problem with this calculation look the formula says the present value of the cash flow is equal to cash flow which is to, uh, 220000 usd a year multiply uh, by the discount factors look one thing I find there's a problem with this calculation. The problem is that I am not recognizing any discount factor. So I say $220,000 after one year, after two years, after three years, four years, and five years. So I'm basically saying that the $220,000 which you get after fifth year are as valuable as you get after one year. Are you with me? If you lend me money and I want to return you and I asked you, hey, this, these are the 10 euros I borrowed from you yesterday. Should I give this money to you now or after one year, what will you prefer? I borrowed money from you yesterday. Today, I want to give it back. 
but i asked you okay thanks thanks a lot i got 10 euros from you yesterday uh do you want to take it now or after one year what will you prefer So you said that you uh, you you'll prefer now rather than waiting one year, because if you have to wait for one year, it could be possible that I disappear. I don't give the money back to you. There could be many reasons. All right. So you will prefer now, but if I insist to you that hey, uh, I think you should take after one year. what would you ask me if you have no option but to wait for one year what would you say what would you ask me some interest and plus some other risk factors interest is one of the risk factors because um, if you have if you have to wait for one year that and i give you 10 euros after one year then the 10 euro which i give you after one year will not be as valuable uh, as 10 euros today yeah makes sense so i must give you some reward for the waiting time mm -hmm. but waiting time is not the only thing you are bearing you also have a risk the risk is that i can default right so you make a list of factors which can cause you risk or the harassment and then we try to quantify those risk factors and make one percentage that hey i think uh two percent is the interest rate let's say uh there is a risk of default let's say two percent there's a risk of inflation there's a risk of this that 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 and we make a we make a series of potential foreseeable expected risk factors and let's say it comes out to be 7%. All right. It means that, it means what? The 10 euros, which I give you 10 euros after one year would be 7% less valuable. All right. So I must give you 7% more on top of 10% so that your risk is covered. All right. So this is the problem with this calculation. Can you see it? There is a sum of future cash flows, but these are not discounted. So I treat that 220,000, which you get at the end of fifth year, are as valuable as you get after one year. No, there's a more risk involved in the money you get after fifth year. And this risk has to be recognized has to be measured, calculated, and applied on your future cash inflows. So the biggest problem with this calculation is that this is everything is fine, but it is without discount factor. So we need this, this one rate, this one rate, which is incorporating all the risks and everything together is called discount rate. You get my point? So this is fine, but this is not fine at the same time. This is not fine because I assume that the cash you receive at the end of fifth year is as valuable as you get at the end of first year, which is a fallacy, not true. Therefore, I must involve the rate of discount. And this is a starting point of net present value. All right. Uh, Okay, so this is the some basic calculation. I can push the board away now and make some room for myself. Um, but very quickly, uh, I want to take, I want to go to this slide. Yeah, uh, here. Let's assume that a project is costing you $100,000. Can you see this? $100,000. The project life is five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
the money, the cash inflows, which come at the end of each year is 25,000. Okay. If you ask a layman, is this project good or bad? He would say great. How he would say great the way I did here. This is a non-financial way, which I, it, it could be nice mathematically, but it's not right financially. Okay. So what this person would do, he would say, yes, 25,000 you are getting each year for five years. So 25 multiplied by five, 125,000 you're getting, 100,000 you're spending. So you are getting a surplus of 25,000. The person is doing the same mistake which I did on the board. The person forgot that the money which you receive loses value. There's a risk involved in the future cash inflows. This risk has to be recognized. And then somebody with the finance knowledge comes here and he says that, hey, you know what? There is a 10% rate of discount. The rate of discount involves the interest rate for sure, but also the other risk premium. As I said that the guy who you lend this money can disappear. There can be default. There could be inflation. Uh, there could be the market collapsation. There could be even wars and, and is any, any, any catastrophe can occur. Mm -hmm. So who would know that somebody owes you money? So all these factors together, we incorporate in the rate of discount. And then we, uh, you can see these ready-made tables, uh, but I will let, let you know how you can find it by yourself. If the rate of discount is 10%, it means that a dollar after one year is not equal to $1 today. It's equal to $0.909. And the dollar, which is dollar now, is $0.826 at the end of second year, 75 cents at the end of third year, approximately 68 cents at the end of fourth year. And by the end of fifth year, a dollar today is worth 62 cents. It means that the dollar you get after one year, it will still be a dollar, but its present value is 62 cents. All right. And then when you multiply column two and three, so practically you will not get 25,000 at the end of first year, you will get 25,000 in terms of face value, but the real value will be equal to 22,725 today. So the money which you get 25,000 after one year is worth $22,725 today. And so on and so forth. And then you find that the sum of sigma, sigma CI, where I go from one to five is equal to 94,750. Whereas the cost of the project is 100,000 today, C0. Now, cash outflow is 100,000. You are having a sum total of discounted future cash inflows, 94750. You have the cash outflow potentially is 100,000. What you spend is more, what you get is less. You have a loss on this investment. You can see minus 5250. So basically your formula would be the sum of discounted future cash flows minus C0. And since this is negative, it means that your spendings are more and your incomes are less. Hence, this project is absolutely unacceptable. Would you like to invest in a project where you know right now, before you invest, you will have a loss. If I have money, I would rather keep this money in my pillows than investing because I know for sure, well, not, I shouldn't say sure, but I, all my calculation, all my skills are giving me a message that I would be spending more than what I gain, what I get. All right. So it's quite highly likely that I would be having a loss on this project. So I would rather not invest it. So the rule number one, we never, never consider 
the project with negative net present value. Okay, when you work as a corporate finance manager, you will have so many proposals, so many options to invest your money in various projects. Okay, the one simple benchmark is that filter out those projects with negative NPV. Don't consider them at all. And then shortlist the positive ones and pick up those which have the highest positivity. Do you get my point? Let's say you have a pr proposal uh, on your table of 20 projects. Five are uh, negative NPV. Throw them away. 15 left with positive NPV. Okay. But the problem is that you are not having unlimited money with you. You don't have the unlimited financial resources. Then pick up the one which have the highest possible, uh, high, highest possible positive NPV. Mm -hmm. So if you can only invest in three projects, okay, assuming that all project costs same, uh, pick up those three with the highest positive NPV and ignore the rest. This is the way you can optimize your investment. Does it make sense? Now, the second thing is that these discount rates are not just interest rate. The interest rate is the cost which you uh, bear for waiting before you get your money. So it's like if it's like a, you wait for it, but waiting is not the only risk. The risk of default, the risk of inflation, uh, the risk of, okay, all right, if you are investing, if you are living in Finland and you're investing in South America, then there's also a risk that uh, the, the currency fluctuation can also be a risk. So the exchange rate fluctuation is also a risk for one year. And here it's for five years. All right. Uh, there could be a problem that maybe there is some political change. There could be some, uh, there, there can even be some, uh, a political crisis. There could be army coup or there could be some, you know, change of war and things like that. And there can also be some, uh, some catastrophe, some natural fury, something wrong can happen in the five years, right? Uh, it can be possible the person who you gave this money to disappears, but you can, you can also disappear in five years time. <laughs> you know, you never know. Future is so uncertain, right? So here we include all, we incorporate all foreseeable uh, risk uh, into the discount factor. One problem with this formulation is that we assume that uh, the rate of discount would remain common or same. Okay? Whereas there, there, one thing is for sure that risk is there, but risk will not remain same for all the years. Okay? But when you study this topic in the more advanced uh, fashion, you can also consider uh, changing or revising of your rate of discount. But the basic argument remains same that today we want to see the discounted uh, future cash inflows total uh, minus uh, the, the cash outflow, which means expenditure uh, on investment today. And if that happens to be positive, the project, I'm not saying accepted, no, the project can be considered to be accepted. So a positive NPV is a qualification of a project to be accepted or not. If positive, acceptable, I will not say accepted, I will say acceptable. <coughs> All right, but if it is negative, uh, I will not say rejectable, I would say rejected because you would, you would never consider it at all. With positive NPV, you may take it, you may not take it, but with a negative NPV, you will definitely not take it. Does it make sense? Now, this normally this discount rate is fairly, um, you can calculate, you can see the tables, but there's a, there's a way you can calculate it by yourself also, okay? Uh, I can show you how it works. We need to go to Excel. Um, so I can do the same question with the, uh, how to say it? with Excel, okay? So the cash CI, let's say, was 25,000, 
25,000. I'm doing it so that you can also do by, with the help of Excel. Two, is it 25,000? One, two, three, five years. Yeah. And then C0, uh, C0 is the cash outflow, which is, uh, yeah, this is 100,000. One, two, three, four, huh? sorry? No, this is the cost. Initial cash outlay. Okay, so the rate of discount is how much? 10%, which is 0 0.10. I want to show it 10, so I format myself so that there's no ambiguity. And two decimals, yeah. Look the way we calculate the discount rate. Uh, the discount rate is, is equal to one divided by this. To the power of one, yeah. Isn't it one plus two? Sorry? Isn't it one divided by one plus two? So it should be one divided by one plus. Oh, sorry, this one, right? uh, yeah. And because it's the end of one year, so it, even though it doesn't matter, but I can say to the power of, sorry, where is to the power of sign? uh here i think yeah to the power of one there we go and then here so it has to be fixed value so i put the dollar sign here does dollar show up no it's pound Okay, so C four but because here the years will be two, so I make it two years. Here I make three years. Here I make four years because it's the end of fourth year, and this is at the end of fifth year. So it means that uh, the dollar which you receive after one year is worth 91 cents today. And the dollar you get after fifth year is 62 cents today, given that the rate of discount is five, all right? Uh, once again, if you ask a layman, he would say, wow, 25,000 multiplied by five, 125,000 is the income, 100,000 is the cost, we make money. No, it doesn't go like this. So you have to multiply, find out the present value of future cash flows, which is multiply by this. And if you, if you sum it, if you drag it down, and now if you sum it up, some no this project is loss making because this is what you get and this is what you spend hence this project is negative npv it's unacceptable project all right okay so higher the rate of discount more likely a project would be rejected and lesser the discount rate uh, 
most like more like not most likely but the more likely the projects the likelihood of the acceptance will be acceptability not acceptance acceptability will increase okay remember when a npv is negative the project is for sure rejected but if there is a positive npv the project may be accepted so this is something you keep in mind uh, because ultimately if it is accepted and you want to implement it then you need money but the question is that do you have money um, and if you have money it will not be unlimited it will be limited money yeah and then we pick up those projects with with have, which have highest possible uh, npv net present value okay and and those projects we accept given that all the projects are costing you same amount of money otherwise we we'll take the ratios so this is basically this is 94769 is this this formula so when i say c i i move from 1 to n this is this 94000 okay here i sum up the future cash flow from year 1 to year 5 here n is 5 so depending upon how many years so it's like a formulation okay so we can make one formula like an algorithm this so this is how you calculate the cash flows okay um yeah uh yeah it's here and then the questions we need to consider is that where this uh, discount rate come from well this is the mathematical formula, but anyways, it's the same. Um, where does this discount rate come from? Well, the, this discount rate is the opportunity cost of capital. Um, okay, this can also be, uh, the discount rate can also be the, uh, the rate of dividends because if you are not investing this money in the project imagine uh, you have invested in my company and i have earned profits and now i have money to share with you called dividend yeah and i give you option would you like to have five percent dividend now or should i invest this money on a new project and you say that no i think you should don't give us dividend don't give us five percent dividend uh you can recycle this money in the future investments because maybe i'm a growth company you want me to grow so that your your stock price can go up so in that case uh you can use the dividend rate five percent as a rate of discount because had i given this money to you you would have been richer by five percent but since you are not giving it, you're not taking it, all right? Therefore, the opportunity cost of not having dividend and letting me reuse your money is 5%. So there are many ways you can get this discount rate, okay? Uh, but I see it differently. For me, the rate of discount is including all the micro risk, uh, which is unsystematic risk, plus some of the systematic risk also, okay? because uh, i would also see the macroeconomic risk if the same company is in finland and giving me the option i would treat it differently but if the same company is somewhere else i would also take into account the country risk also country risk company risk plus country risk so for me uh, having this cash flow from some African country, from Asian country, or from some Latin American country, uh, for me, this rate of discount would be higher because riskiness will be more. Make sense? So you go through these slides, and it, it also depends upon, uh, even in the same country, even in the same country, who is offering you, which company you are talking about. If the company is like, uh, uh, growth company like microsoft like apple but those are established companies yeah the known companies but remember if there's a company this company is offering me 
you know the 12 percent return then my rate of discount will be uh i have to reconsider it have you heard the name of this company a company fly by night electronics have you heard it haven't you heard it are you serious you don't know fly by night electronics just google it you will find out no there's no such company existing it's a hypothetical company fly by night means you invest today maybe this company fly by night and tomorrow you are left with nothing so if uh if 12 percent is offered by um uh, apple and at the same by the fly by night electronics uh then i think this 12 percent is too less if apple is giving me four percent and fly by night is giving me 12 percent okay then maybe on the and if i think that 12 percent because this company is three times riskier than apple imagine uh then the rate of discount on the future cash flow of apple would be four percent but for this 12 percent so i would treat this company risky companies with a higher rate of discount mm -hmm. The lowest rate of discount you may use is the treasury bill rate, because that's risk free, basically. All right. Uh, that's the lowest possible rate of discount. But usually in the corporate sector, uh, the rate of discount is higher, but some companies are riskier than the others. Uh, those will be, uh, we shall be applying the higher rate of discount on them. Okay. So there are many other things in this slide, but primarily this is the purpose of this. Mm -hmm. So I give you some time to think about it. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask me. The next uh, criteria, whether we accept a project or we don't is called uh, payback period method. Payback period method. In the payback period method, we see that how quickly a investment project can pay you for the cost. You know what I mean? If you spend 100 euros today on a project and it takes five years, or five, let's say because you are investing only 100 euros, uh, it takes five months before you recover 100 euros you spent in project A. In project B, it takes you three months before you recover your cost. In the third project, it, it takes you two months. All right. Then that project which which covers our cost in the shortest time have the shortest payback period and that project is accepted does it make sense right uh, we pick up the project with the less the least uh, waiting period all right so the project which recovers your cost uh, as soon as possible you know the shortest span of time has the shortest payback period and that is accepted but there's a problem the problem is highlighted here look perhaps you will get some ideas if you are attentive the three projects each of them have same cost c0 because it's a cost so i put the sign minus in front the project a you get 500 first year 500 second year 5000 third year all right so you can't recover your cost before third year can you see it so you can't recover your cost before third year but if you look at the npv this project has net present value 2624 but look at the second project 
This you can recover the cost in two, two years, five plus 18, more than 2000, even after rate of discount. But the problem is that this project is having a negative NPV. In the third project, uh, same cost, but the numbers are reversed. So the money, this money comes in the year two, but it comes in the first year. This comes in the first year, but here it comes in the second year. And here, the NPV is plus 15. Now here, we are in a slightly uh, contradiction. Contradiction. The project which was the best according to NPV method, you know, here I'm using 10% rate of discount. The project which was uh, having, which was the best according to NPV method is rejected completely because this has the highest period. The project which would never be accepted according to NPV method is, is one of the preferred project. And here you can see that two projects with two years, they both have equally acceptability, but look at them. One is positive NPV and the other is negative NPV. Isn't strange, isn't nonsensical, right? So we have a contradiction here. So the best project according to NPV is not even considered because it has a higher payback period. And those who have the shorter uh, or the lesser payback period, one of them is having a negative NPV. So there's a contradiction. There's a fight between uh, there's a fight between NPV and uh, payback period method. Okay. Let's see. Let's let's check with Excel because now we have those uh, uh, formulations. So if I wait a sec. Um, so the first project was, so if I take this as a cost 2000, sorry. And the first project was costing how much? Five, five, 5,000. So if it is 500, 500 and 5,000. And this is, doesn't exist, this doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. Uh, this doesn't exist. And if I have a sum, of this, and if it is uh, this minus this, the sum of discounted cash flows minus the cost. Look, it's very nice, it's very nice. But if I have uh, the project which gives me five, 18 and zero. So if we have 500, 1800 and zero, uh, because the project is over in the third year. All right. And if I find their discounted cash flows, so if, for example, I multiply this with, oops, this with this. And if I find the sum, And here, this minus this is negative. This project should be absolutely unacceptable, but it looks to be acceptable. It looks unacceptable. Well, it not looks, it is unacceptable according to NPV method, but by payback method, it's better because it takes three years here, but it takes two years here. And if I just reverse the numbers, well, it doesn't matter, 1800. 500 so this is so basically we get these numbers here what we were trying to obtain
an obvious question comes to mind is that if the project NPV is not as good as, if this payback period method is not as good as NPV, why we even study it or why we use it as a criteria of investment? I would say that many companies, despite despite having problems with the NPV technique, sorry, I was a little bit stuck. Um, the, the, the point is that why do we use payback period method if it is not as sophisticated and as uh, meaningful and logical as uh, NPV and believe I, before I discuss it, I must tell you very clearly that many companies, despite its shortcomings, they use payback period method quite often. And the reason are here, first, the senior managers, they want to get the reward before they retire. Are you with me? The managers are very short-sighted. If you are a CEO of a company and in two years time, you will retire. Would you like to start a project whose benefit and the claim and the credit would be taken by your successor? Tell the truth, don't be polite. Or do you want to claim the benefit or all the credit during your tenure? So if you are, and the managers remember, uh, they, they, are, they, they want to claim the benefits. They want, because um, in many companies, your bonuses, your pension, your salary is attached to your performance. So you rather have low NPV project, but which finishes faster so that you can prove your success. Because if you don't do it, you are retired or transferred and somebody else comes, then he or she would claim all the success or even failure, you know. Do you get my point? So the managerial short-sightedness, the managerial short-termist attitude could be a one reason why several potentially very high positive NPV projects are sacrificed because just because their payback period is longer. But think about it, if you're a manager, are you not concerned about the longevity or the sustainability of the company's success? Do you want to make success faster or do you want to make success sustainable, which can last for many years? Well, if you think from the a very idealistic point of view, your answer should be second answer, you know, the second, the latter choice. Unfortunately, it's not true in many cases, the company managers, the top managers, CEO, CFO, uh, they have a short termist attitude. They want to prove their success faster and quicker so that they can show their success to the shareholders. And many times these managers don't do it on their wish, on their will. Given the choice, these managers would choose a long-term project, but because there's lots of pressure by the shareholders on them that, hey, make money faster. They lack patience. And this pressure of shareholders is reflected on the actions or the choice of the projects by the managers. So instead of choosing a good long-term sustainable high positive NPV project, they end up picking a very mediocre uh, NPV project, but with the shortest possible payback period. Okay, so it means we are wasting lots of corporate wealth. Okay, so this is a corporate governance problem that, that how the, the, the companies are governed. But the point is that the managers truly want to uh, claim the benefits as fast as possible. Uh, yeah, so that second is basically the, what I discussed already. Um, yeah, and also, also, there's a problem. 
the problem is by the lenders. If I go to a bank and I say, Mr. Mr. or Miss Bank Manager, I want some loan from you. And they say, okay, show me the, your project proposal, your finance plan. And they find out that this project will be completed in 10 years time. Believe me, they'll be not very willing to give me the loan because they have to wait for 10 years. But if I make a project proposal, which is having a shorter period, uh, they would be perhaps ready to give money to me. But if I ask a banker for a long-term project completion with, with a very high positive NPV, but they say, no, we, we can't wait. So because of investors pressure, because of the shareholders pressures, because of the managers, uh, bonuses, pension, salaries attached to the performance. Uh, they want to perform faster, quicker. And at the end, uh, the company is the one who suffers. So there is always a, a cost attached to it. And, and most of these points which I discussed with you uh, were discussed quite often in corporate governance that, hey, why, how the managers, why do the managers behave like this? Well, there is a politics. The third uh, and the last uh, technique which we shall discuss today is called internal rate of return method, IRR. The internal rate of return method is somewhat similar to NPV, but the word is internal, yeah? And if you look at the rate of discount we use in NPV method, the rate of discount come from outside. Do you get my point? When I say, remember the previous examples? I took 10% rate of discount. The question is, where does it come from? Answer is, I don't know. Well, I know, but it's, not, it's coming from outside. I make some estimate of systematic risk. I make some estimate of rate of interest. I make some estimate of inflation, uh, GDP forecast, and then I combine them, and that gives me some estimate of rate of discount. Here, the rate of discount comes within the company, within the project. The rate of discount is coming within the firm, within the project. Homegrown, internal. That's why we use the word internal rate of return. The internal rate of return is that rate of return which makes the discounted cash flows, the present value of uh, discounted future cash flows equal to the cost of the project. The internal rate of return is that rate which makes your NPV zero on purpose. All right, an internal rate of return method is more rigorous than uh, NPV because in NPV method, we pick up those projects where, where NPV is positive. But here, the criteria is that that rate of return where NPV is zero. So we want to have a higher possible rate of discount. It means we treat the project more harshly. We have a higher risk premium. All right, so we'll discuss it now. Um, I have an example which I shared with you already uh, in Optima. Maybe I, it's in spreadsheets I've uploaded today. Uh, NPV IRR calculation. So let's see, what does it look like? Um, this is something else, but go here, for example. Look at that. This question seems to be as before we discussed. Your cost of investment is $10,000, euros, whatever. The money, the cash inflows the first year, the cash inflow second year, the cash inflow third year, yeah? The rate of discount is 
10%. Now, this rate of discount is coming externally from outside. Are you with me? And then when we apply this, we apply NPV. So you can also apply NPV straight away. Look, you can find NPV formula in the spreadsheet as well. So what I did, uh, NPV, the first thing is rate. Can you see that rate here? Can you read this? Rate is 10%, value one, value two, value three, and so on and so forth. So when we have all these values, minus 10,000, we find a positive uh, net present value project. But then why do we use internal rate of return? The internal rate of return is the maximum return, maximum. You can squeeze the project and take out. All right. And how I do it, very simple. Look at here. Look, look at the formula. IRR and I include all the cash outflows and inflows. Look at B3. B3 is cash outflow. B4, B5, B6, cash inflow. And when I take them, it, it comes to be this project is maximum capable of generating 16% rate of return. Highest return which this project can generate is 16%. That's called internal rate of return. All right. Uh, this, so this is the potential of the project. You know the potential? The maximum capacity. And now when you run this project and your actual return is 14%, 13%, it means what? you are not making full use of your project. You are performing below what you are capable of. This is called internal rate of discount. So you can, you can hear in this example, you can compare NPV and here 10%, I don't know where it comes from. I just make some estimate. Of course, I, I don't take it out of my uh, fancies. I make some homework. But this comes from outside. But this rate, this one, this is generated within the project. And by the way, this project, this rate of return is not for the whole company. For each project, you know what? For each project, the cost is different. For each project, the, the cash flow estimates are different. So you can find, IRR, not for the full company, but also for the individual projects. And what's the definition of a firm? A firm is a collection of projects. So you can go even deeper and find out that what is the maximum potentiality of uh, revenue generating for each project in the company. As long as, as long as you know the cost of the project, and the future uh, cash inflows. This comes by itself. I have no idea where it comes from, but I know that this project is maximum generating 16% off. And here, the rate of your opportunity cost is 10%. So here, as long as, look, when I compare 16% and 10%, if, I actually get more than 10% revenue from this project. I'm very happy. That's a 12%. But this 12% which I get, which is more than this, is less than this. So a project which is okay according to NPV method is not okay according to IRR method. So the this 16% is the capability of the project. And the capability of the project is 16%. You generate 12%. I think you are not fully uh, optimizing your project. Mm -hmm. And NPV, uh, the, the rate of discount, 10% is a bar. So the minimum is 10%. Uh, you must generate. The highest capacity is 16%. And the actual return could be in between or beyond. If it is beyond 16%, great, which is very rare. Uh, but 
if it is below 10%, it's definitely uh, you're not re recovering your cost properly. You, do you get my point? So that is why we call it internal rate of return. This is, this is coming within the project, okay? So please go through this spreadsheet thoroughly. And uh, and what? And then there are some more slides, some uh, some related slides, and I would say that you must go through them. Um, yeah. And by the way. Uh, a very important thing which I want to share with you that remember we were discussing about the uh, yeah uh, the rate of discount yeah I have a solution for you how where does where this rate of return come from the, sorry the the discount rate come from you have done capm have you you know capm you can use capm as a rate of discount. Hey, you have, a, you have a very nice situation. If you look at your operating cash flow, yeah, the company's operating cash flow for the last five years, and your discount at CAPM for each year, you can find out the net present value. Of course, I'm not asking you to do it. It's not a task, but just out of curiosity, if you can calculate CAPM for different years, let's say 2015, 16, 17, 18, and then you have the cash flows, operating cash flows, 2015, 16, 17, 18, you can calculate the net present value of a project, or at least the present value of those, those cash flows. So that the rate of discount, uh, remember, uh, yeah. So the rate of discount can be estimated with the help of CAPM also. And the companies which are risky, the CAPM rate of return is more because high beta and the companies which are less risky, the CAPM rate of return is less because of less beta. All right. It means that you can say that it's safer to invest in the safe companies, which is a very stupid statement, uh, but it's a fact. So you can, you can estimate uh, the discount rate from the CAPM determined rate of return. So that's possible then IRR. Yeah, so, well, basically that's the end of the topic. <laughs>